Hello and welcome to Brian Bowes Full Contact with The Telegraph. Well, we are finally underway in the test series between the British and Irish Lions and South Africa. And if you didn't know, it's first blood to the Lions who produced an impressive second half performance comeback, beat the reigning world champions in Cape Town. The last time a side failed to win the series, having won the first test, was back in 2001. So it's very much advantage to Warren Gatlin's side as they head into the second test on Saturday, which, of course, as you will probably also know, is now also at sea level in Cape Town. Uh, the box haven't been able, because of COVID restrictions, to take the second two tests, the last two tests, up to the high belt, which I'm sure would have given them a little bit of an advantage. There's been much talk in the build-up of the official Marius Jonker, who was TMO, whether it would benefit the home side, but it didn't, and I'm not sure it was ever going to. I think that was a, a scandalous uh, accusation to make anyway. There are a number of game-changing decisions that went in the Lions' favour. One man who does know a thing or two about officiating is former referee Nigel Owens. He was in the commentary booth at the weekend, and he'll be joining us shortly to discuss some of the big calls from Saturday's Test match. Well, as for South Africa, look, they started strong, they might have finished strong. Uh, we'll get into that very shortly with the former Springbok captain Bob Skinstad. But there are a number of things that didn't quite go for them. The decision to replace their front row half time backfired. The discipline in the second half uh, was a bit wayward. And uh, well, well, what can they do? What can they do? There's a limited number of things. But we will, we will, we will sort all this out. Bob, look, Rosie Erasmus, to be fair to him, he hasn't sought to whinge about the decisions. And that wasn't really the reason either side lost or won anyway. But what, what, what particularly, in your opinion, went wrong for the, for the Springboks? Brian, I, I, first of all, thanks for having me here after a, a, a very good victory. Well done for, for your team and, um, and the guys on the field. And I think strategically the Springboks were, were undone. The, mm-hmm. the Lions, for me, um, you know, we've had different themes, haven't we? We've had, are they going to be undercooked? Have they had enough game time? physically okay, COVID, like all those kind of things. With different themes where we're going, which one's going to affect us the most? And I think none of those, none of the above actually happened. I think they got it strategically wrong. They made right. too many mistakes in the second half. And I think they got um, the, the, the oncoming bench at halftime. They gave them directly 40 minutes. For me, you've had a good 40 minutes. You've got a nine-point lead. You've just had a 12-minute break or 10-and-a-half-minute break. You know, come on. Go for your life for seven or eight or nine minutes and then put your amazing bench on. So yeah. they didn't do that. They put on an entire new front row. And then the first instance, the kickoff, Lions dominated, got a penalty, kicked it up. Uh, sorry, kicked a, a, an up and under, got a penalty from that, dominated, went to the line out, dominated and scored a try. Yeah. For me, game changing instance. And that was a strategic mistake by the team. What happened particularly, because one of the notable features for me was that the Lions didn't get on at all well in the first half with the ball in the air. In the second half, it changed completely. Now, there were changes in personnel, but there were also similarities in the people who were catching, chasing, uh, and so on. But it, it, yet it just... And that had a, a huge effect to me. I, th- I think you're right. So, so my, my quick assessment of that is... And we've spoken about it. You know, Cheslin Colby is, is a, an amazing try-scoring winger and... and with the ball in space, he's he's devastating. But he is diminutive. He, you know, he's he, he's he's shorter than most of the international wings. So, if you can get whoever it is, Elliot Daly, Duhan van der Merwe, Anthony Watson, or someone into the air above Cheslin Colby, he's going to have a foot, almost yes. a foot's worth of ad- advantage. And you know what happened was every ball they kicked on him in the second half, they were into the air. And I think you know Price started kicking the ball. A little bit further, so there was more momentum, more running towards it. Whereas yep. South Africa kicked well in the first half, low raking kicks from Fafta Clack, getting getting territory, etc. Then in the second half, started kicking kicks that didn't go a long way forward. So all of the competing ball came from Colby standing still. And you you know a, a big a good big one's going to beat a good little one, yeah. uh, and, and and it doesn't matter how. So I I don't think um, I think South Africa got that wrong. Whereas the Lions got it right. And for me, that's the crocodile jaws. The more the Lions started to get it right, South Africa started to get it wrong, and they just yeah. the two teams split. So what um, I I wrote about this that the Lions in the fortunate position, and I would think if Warren I would think Warren Gatland uh, will change a winning starting fifteen. Uh, I don't think the centre pairing particularly worked in the first half. Elliot Daly uh, had his, probably his poorest game. Um, 
and he has been playing well there. Didn't didn't look out of sorts uh, and gave penalties away. Um, the, but they have a lot of they have an awful lot of of options basically on the bench. And you look at the South African bench and and what's available to them, um, and 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 that it's more limited now. Is there anything that the South African can do, or should they be, in your opinion, just saying, "Right, look, it's only a five-point game. Don't panic. Um, this is the this is the the, the the way this is the way we can uh, resurrect our series." Um, or, or do they just have to go for bust? No, I think I think, <laughs> I mean, you, you're 100 percent right. It's only a five-point game, and I I think that's so hard to say to a team though, because every you know five or fifty-point game you've lost it, and, yes. and you you get all down on yourself, and you know they're going to have to really build themselves up and say, listen, game of two halves, we won one, lost one. The Lions were much better in the second half. We were much better in the first half. So now let's let's look at it like that, and let's let's prepare for the second test. Do you know what's more ironic, of the good though, things. Bobby? Is in the first half when they were on top, I hardly got near the line, the the the, the, the you know the, um, the the British and Irish lines line to score. Second half when they're under the cosh, two tries. All right, you know, um, and, and 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 other chances. They were you know, disallowed ones and so on. Yep. Which no, no, me, no, look, I, they, they can. You've you know, got to. Uh, for me, you've you've got to build in. You've got to be. You know, Rassi Erasmus and Jacques Ninamo have got to say to their players, "Listen, guys." Let's just do let's let's play that exact test match ten times in a row. You know we're going to win more than five of them. We're gonna we're gonna win seven of those test matches. We actually snatched defeat from the jaws of victory here. We you know we had a nine point lead. We didn't get any of the the TMO decisions going our way. And I'm and I'm not saying they should have, but I am saying that they didn't because yep. you can those kind of things happen. And and you know we weren't on our game. Now the problem with that is you've lost it. Yeah. So the, the all the pressure. Even if you did get it a hundred percent wrong, all that pressure is on you. Yes, you know, and 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 they they actually got a lot of it right, so they've got to try and draw some confidence from from the bits they got right. As you say, it's a bit of a it's a it's a it's a, it's a subtle message, and one that goes against your emotion, doesn't it? Because the emotion of defeat is sod it, yeah, throw everything out, mm-hmm. let's start again, and uh, it, can you say with any certainty that? There will, I tell you what, in, in the second and third test, there will be a certain number of very significant calls mm-hmm. somewhere from the TMO, from the referee. Um, and whilst I, I think they got most of them right, apart from, uh, the, for, tell you what, for me, the Watson one, we'll discuss with the Nigel, so uh, we'll, we'll bring it up again. But I thought Watson was lucky not to get a yellow card. Should definitely right. call one. In, in, and in I the, thought in the Premiership, that, that, that's a yellow, if not a red, not I th- the other way I th- around. I thought Larue was on the side, because if you look, if you looked at the uh, the orange boot, which Will Greenwood was talking about, not his body, but his boot, which was outside, mm-hmm. um, I thought he was. I thought he was level. It well, looks, ex- you know exactly, and, and and you probably find the whole of South Africa did, and and, and Rassi Erasmus did. So you're right; they've they've got to have a bit of a subtle message and say, "Hey guys, but if a bounce of the ball went our way, we we won the first test. We didn't, so now we need to be on our game more, and we're up against it because we might have a few injuries. We might be, uh, you know, the the, the famous uh, '97 speech of you know this is your Everest. South Africa have got to turn around and say our Everest yeah. is now to to make this um, one test all. Yeah, because come what may, we don't want. We don't want the dead. We don't want to be a dead rubber. The last, the last test. It will still be something. We'll still be competitive, because players are competitive. But that's that's not what we want. Absolutely. Well, time to uh, discuss some of the uh, some of the talking points, shall we say, from uh, the first test and the refereeing decisions. Uh, great to speak to a regular contributor to the podcast. The former international referee, now studio. What do you, what do you call yourself now, Nigel Pundit? Uh, expert referee uh, in the box or whatever. What 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 are they billing you as? <laughs> <laughs> Not an expert referee, that's for sure. <laughs> I'll call a, a farmer. We, we, oh, fair enough. For a, farmer. a farmer who knows a bit about rugby laws. That's fair enough. Then live to Nigel Owens, the farmer who knows a bit about rugby laws. Nigel, there was a you was a bit of a. A chat, you know, you know, ill, ill, Ill mannered, if you ask me, about Marius Yonker being the TMO for the game. Did you ever think there was any likelihood of him being pressured one way or another, and, and either going too far for the Lions to try and prove his neutrality, or, or vice versa? 
I wouldn't think so, Brian. From my own experience, you know, it's the same we had in the, in, in the in the old Celtic League, the Pro Fourteen, where sometimes you referee a Welsh side against an Irish side or a Scottish side, you know, and you went out there and you and you did your job professionally and refereed it uh, as as you saw it because that, that, that's what you have to do. It, it, it's your job. A little bit like. Stephen Gerrard, you know, a Liverpool supporter as a kid, played for them all his career, and then now he's managing Rangers. Well, when Liverpool play Rangers, he, he's not going to mess about with the, with the tactics in hoping that Liverpool will win, is he? You know, he's professional, he's there to do a job, and it's the same for, for a match official. So, you know, as far as you doing your job, you know, you go out there and you do your job, you do your job professionally. Now, obviously, what that does bring is it brings a perception then from outside within, um, you know, and you know, if, if he was going to make a call, he went against the Lions, you know, the Lions supporter was saying, well, he's a South African. If he makes a call then against South Africa, the South African supporter is going saying, well, he's done that to prove that he's, he's not being biased, you know. So it's a very difficult situation and a lot of pressure on you um, that is not really needed. But as far as you doing your job, then you go out and do it. Now, I can't answer for the individuals whether subconsciously, you know, you're thinking about this, whether it plays in your mind when you're doing decisions. I don't know. Personally, I just went out there and refereed as, as, as I saw it. But uh, it does put pressure on you from the outside, that's for sure. And, but, you know, you just got a professional and get on with your job. Nigel Bobskin said here, um, good to speak to you and, and, and uh, I hope you're very well. I've got to quickly ask you about two things. I thought you were fantastic in the, in the group of commentators on the weekend and well done on that. You spoke early on about consistency and, and Nick Berry you know, is going to have to try and be consistent. Um, and then the, the, the one incident that I think maybe he wasn't so consistent um, with what's been happening in the, in the Northern Hemisphere is Hamish Watson's tackle. I know it's a ranging question. Could you have a go at that for us? Yeah, probably. Hi. Um, you know, I think as far as maybe him being not consistent, that was the only one of that sort of type of infringement in the game. So if you look at it in the perception of him making that decision, there was no other decision to look at in the game to whether decide whether he was consistent or not. Now, a total different argument would be should it be a yellow card? And, and my personal view is... Yes, it should be a yellow card in in any he- hemisphere because we used to have a lot of those tackles in the game. They really are dangerous and you don't want them in the game. So You're what right. referees did, they clamped down on them really hard. Sometimes people thought that it was a bit harsh. But we got them out of the game. You don't see those tackles much happening. No, you're right. Because players are aware that if you do it, you're in trouble. So I was a bit surprised, to be honest, um, to see it just a penalty. Because for me, it, it certainly was. To me, it was a pretty straightforward yellow card. And, and yeah, look, no decisions are easy to make uh, in big matches like that, particularly when it comes to giving a card, whatever colour the card is. But to me, that was a pretty straightforward one there wouldn't have been any arguments around that one if a yellow card would have been given whereas now people are discussing it so yeah but i agree with you on that that type of play um, of, of action to me certainly w- warrants a, a yellow card and i think i'm pretty sure well i tell you that, I, mean, Jill, I, I i agree with uh, i agree with you so i Nigel, i agree with you i agree with bob i think everyone <laughs> if i haven't heard anyone disagree and say that it wasn't uh, a yellow and that Watson wasn't lucky on that occasion. It just brings into account something that I wanted to bring with you in relation to the uh, LaRue non-try that was given, is what happens with you know, the, the TMO. He went from being uh, a very tight call to being absolutely certain that LaRue was in front. Now, I, 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 don't, I, I couldn't see from the video footage that he was watching, if it was the same as what I was watching, what changed to make him go from it being very tight, which it can't have been um, if he was absolutely certain, um, from one to the other. Um, because I thought, and they, look, you can replay it as much as you want, but I thought that uh, Will Greenwood on the, on the commentary afterwards um, was right in saying, if you actually look, not at the bodies, but at where the left boot of, uh, of the winger is, when he, when he touches the ball, LaRue is arguably very arguably, behind if not, if not on, on side. So uh, can you just tell what, a lot of people have been asking for the clarification on this rule. Can you, can you start with the law itself? 
Yeah, the, the law is if if you are in front of a player or, or your own teammate who last played the ball, then you are in an offside position and you must not do anything to take part in the game again until you are put on side. So basically, Willie Roo had to stop dead until the guy who kicked the ball puts him on side and then he's free to, to, to challenge. So when I was watching this, my gut feeling was, oof, he's inside. Yeah, sorry, he's, he's in front. That was that was my, my gut feeling, he's in front. So if I was refing that and had to make the call then and then, I would have blown it for being in front. That was my, my gut feeling around it. Now, I'll probably confuse everybody is what you quite rightly said there, was the communication probably wasn't very clear and wasn't the best around it. Where it first of all, it sounded more well, very tight. So in that instance, if it's a very tight, call which is very marginal the TMO then should not be overruling the referee because if the referee gives an on-field decision it's a try and the TMO has to have clear evidence to overrule that decision so for what Marius Jonker said first of all was very tight it's not that clear then that was not enough to overrule the on-field decision but then when he gave the decision he then said it's quite clear he's in front, which means he is right then to overrule. So the communication there was was, was not the best and probably confused and mixed a lot of the decision-making process up around it. But to be honest with you uh, and the both of you, my gut, it is very tight, I, I agree with you, but my gut feeling was he's in front. So the fact that his body is in front of the player means that he's in front of the player who last played the ball, so there he's in offside. So... I think the decision is correct to overrule uh, the try by the referee, but if the communication put a little bit of grey around it. But I, I think, to me, the most obvious decision there for me was the forward pass. You know, that to me, that pass is forward. It travels forward. There's not at one stage that ball is flat, then travels forward, or travels backwards, and then goes forward because of momentum. To me, that ball is always travelling forward from when it leaves the passer's hand. So there are two decisions there, really, and maybe the most obvious one would have been the forward pass. Um, but although, as I said, my, my gut feeling was that, that he was in front. And then for me, it was it was the correct in, uh, correct decision given on, on that occasion. What do you think is the difference? And the, imagine those decisions being made in a full stadium, 60,000 <laughs> baying fans. Would that, would that have added to a lot of the pressure on both Berry and Yonker? Um, <laughs> or, you know, or, or even Nick Berry, I suppose, yeah. It, 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 it certainly would add in more pressure. You certainly are in the cauldron of it there, <laughs> for sure. But, you know, I, that didn't make a difference to me. No matter how much the crowd were baying for, for, for your blood, you know, what for an influence. You, you had to make those big calls. That's what you're there to do. So whether it would have made a difference, <laughs> I can't honestly answer you that. But if I was on that field, it wouldn't, have made a, it wouldn't have made a difference to me. And I would like to think it wouldn't have made a difference on the weekend. But there is one thing for sure it does put the pressure on you on that moment in that situation for sure. Uh, there's been criticism from Razi Erasmus in the Springboks about the referee. But actually, I, it's coming in a strange form, hasn't it? It's coming in the form of retweeting, you know, a small account which highlighted various things. They've not actually said it officially. Um, so um, it, it, I just wonder, going into the second test... Um, whether I mean, will there be any extra pressure because of this, or is it just the fact there's always pressure on all the officials all the time to get this right? Well, th th there's always pressure, Brian, for, for for sure about that. But when you have, I suppose, you're going in now to to you know a, a, a game that can decide the series or not, or keeps the series alive from the South African point point of view. So. Is going to be a lot more pressure this weekend. Plus, as well, a few of those calls which could have gone either way, maybe on 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 the weekend with the yellow card we spoke about as well. So there is no doubt there will be more pressure this weekend because of what happened before. We we always used to feel that and see that in the European back to back games where, you know, if you were referring the second leg and there was a lot of controversial decisions or there was a lot of talking points from the game before or there was a narrow couple of points in the in, in the margin of winning or losing, it certainly ramped up the pressure for for, for the second back-to-back -back game. So 
there'll be a lot of pressure, but uh, you know that's what you're there to do as as as, as referees. And uh, I'm not a big fan of um, look whether 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 it's Razi or not on social media. I'm not a big fan of using social media to discuss things like this. You know, we we need <laughs> to keep it in the true values of the game. There are proper channels to go through, and I'm pretty sure that both coaches, if they do have issues with decisions on the weekend, I'd like to think that they will go through the proper channels, which will be going to the World Rugby Head of Referees, Joel Jute, and and Clary, and you know, asking for clarifications. On, on decisions around decisions that they want answers from or, or decisions they may not be be happy from. So I, I really hope we we don't lose that value of, of of respect in the game of rugby and you know it doesn't become trial by by Twitter whether the referee has done the right decision uh, or, or not. You know I hope that we, we we don't lose that value of respect in, in in the game. You know I certainly hope not. It needs to be open forum to discuss discussions and but yeah. Always keep it respectful and, and let's go through the proper channels, you know, if there are questions and queries you want as, as a coach, I, I feel. Nigel, you are a hopeless romantic when it comes to talking about what will happen on social <laughs> media. No, I, agree. Look, I, I totally agree with you. Um, it isn't the right format for, for people involved in the game. It's, you know, unfortunately, as you know, after a game, people will say what they want on these views. But I tell you what, I, I, let me echo um, Bob's assessment of your performance in the, uh, on the, uh, the television well done, mate. Keep it up. Uh, come back and talk to us later on. Hey, cheers. Thanks, both. And all the best. Bob, let's start with second test preview. We, we, we've, to some extent, prefaced parts of it. If you were in Gatlin's shoes, uh, the temptation is always to say, don't change your winning team. But I think there are, there are areas where, actually, I think the Lions could, could improve. I'm not convinced... The daily um, and uh, and Henshaw combined, uh, you know, as well as as they might. Certainly, if you look at what Aki has done with Henshaw in the in the past, and uh, and maybe even Farrell, um, would you would would you consider changes? You you say you you don't consider changes, but then look at look at Gatlin's record. You know, he's he famously dropped Brian O'Driscoll yep. for for the critical test, which which won them the series. Yep. Um, he's 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 moved players in and out of positions for Wales, um, and then been praised afterwards for his foresight and his and his, and his vision. So, yep. so I think we might be surprised by something where that would happen. I'm not too certain. The only only area where I where I I, I hear a lot of different people commenting is is on on Elliot Daly or, or sorry the centre combination. Yeah. I, I I to be honest, I didn't think Elliot was was amazing in the first half. I think he got a lot better. He was very structured in defence and and um, I think I also think he disrupted a lot of those high balls. So so maybe that's one of the reasons he was there. Uh, but they do have centre options. That's that's a big. T- the other area, I think, there's a few people saying, you know, was Jack Conan as as big and strong as he as he could be? I think he was good. I think we've spoken about the contributions, and and he made a lot of them. He did very very well. You know, certainly not as many as Courtney Laws, who was far and away one of the best performances I've seen from a, a blind side for a while. But Conan was was there and thereabouts. And I think, um, what's it in Curry? Well, I th- I think Curry was was. You know, head and shoulders above everybody in terms of the contest for the ball, his physical nature. He was he was bashing people around on the back of a great performance from Alan Wynn and Maro Toja. He was the next guy there and smashed people back. But what I'm thinking is that if if there's an area where Warren Gatlin turns around and goes to one of his tried and tested, it could be potentially bringing in a Talupi Falatau, yeah. who he's used on a lot of big games in the past. But to be honest, you know, Farrell... Um, uh, Connor Murray, they came on and did the job they were picked for. Now, if he wants to pick them for a different job, then that's a whole different strategy. You know, I, I'm, I'm not sure if he's going to change too much right now after what he has seen was working. Well, South Africa, they conceded a combination of 28 turnovers and penalties. Now, that's, that's too high for any team. It's certainly too high uh, for a Springbok side, which, which is, is, is used to averaging nowhere near that. Um, what proportion do you think came from uh, pressure from the Lions, uh, proportion from maybe them getting tired or, or, and so on? And, and basically, is it something that they can reverse it immediately with, with more discipline, better selection, and you perhaps more you know, people having had game time? I think so. I mean, I think, you know, 
Remember, we don't have a lot to work on. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to use a reference, the Georgia game as a reference for what yeah. the Springworks have done. They didn't play in the rugby championship last year. So you go back to the World Cup. In the semi final against Wales, they admitted themselves they made a, far too many mistakes, kept Wales in the game with some long, long range kicks. Can they change it after a first test? Of course they can. It's a, it's a very disciplined unit. They've, they've spent a lot of time together. I think the penalty count in the second half was about eight to one. Yeah. Uh, you know, you give away eight penalties um, and, you can't, and you, the opposition give away one, you're going to lose it. You're going to lose a test match, especially these days when it's so tight. So I think they'll have to, but it'll be a combination of game time and it'll be more so the fact that they've got to keep their head um, in the tight situation. So, so – that in itself puts pressure on Rassi Erasmus to have the right people fulfilling the right roles on the field at the right time. Why don't we go to some questions? Um, Bob Hamilton, um, he says, he said, I said, after this World Cup, nobody has a plan B. South Africa's plan A was the one that was successful enough to win the Cup. Uh, look, um, is it simply a case of them setting out to do what they did against England and, you know, get stuck in up front, uh, you know, play, th- play the game which was very effective in the first half and play that for longer? Do they need to do more? I, uh, Brian, I, I believe that, you know, my comment about the, the strategy is they got it wrong. I, th- I think they should have carried on with that iron-fisted approach to the lineouts and the scrums for at least 50 to 55 minutes of this test match. They should have, they should have t- you know, scored those tries. They should have had a 15 to 17 point um, margin, and they should have then been able to to close out the test. Well, match. if they don't, they got that. We wouldn't be talking it at all in this well, way. Exactly we? right. And I think strategically they got that wrong because they had the chance to score those tries. In fact, just you know, six minutes to go in the first half, they had a fantastic breakaway. The camera angle wasn't amazing on it, but we've seen it from the other side now. A driving line out on the ten meter line. Sia Kalisi almost scored. Yeah, Maro Otoje. Um, definitely supporting himself on his knees. <laughs> well, that, well that, it's funny because they said that was a moment in the game and I remember at the time thinking, you know, they know the clue to this and it's very simple. At home, do this. Stand as though you've got, four, you know, as though you've got the, your studs in the ground. Lean forward and see how far you can get where your foot is flat, right? Yeah. See how far you can get when you've got four in and then see if on two studs at the front... You can possibly support your weight, uh, no matter how far your legs are apart. You can't do it. No, you can't. So do as it. soon as you've got two studs only in the ground, which is what he had, you're definitely not supporting your weight. Yeah. And that's I've said that to referees. Don't look at anything else. Yeah. Just look at the studs in the ground because that tells you everything. Well, I think I think Barry got that com- horribly wrong. Um, and and technically, then you know he's the last he's the last player. Yeah. You know, um, South and then Africa. he goes in the bin. He, 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 he goes yeah, in the bin yeah. exactly exactly so so you know and, and I promise you I'm not whinging about this game I'm, I'm not I, we, we had a, a whole bunch of, South Africa had a whole bunch of things go against them but that's not how you prepare for the next match you prepare for the next match yeah. by building on what was good so like I said should have driven it home for the 55 to um, 50 to 55 minutes yeah. and then been able to launch an attack with a new fresh squad on from the bench let's go on to uh, well I, it's attributed to Andrew but it's, it came up a lot um, I posted. I, I simply said this. I do not think anybody, Neil Jenkins, Razi Rasmus, anyone, anyone, and, and I do this with players. I, I won't. I don't want anyone mic'd up, um, coming on as a water boy, giving instructions. A lot of people have said, you know, it's antediluvian. This is the way things go. To me, I prefer the contest on the field to be as as far as possible. The fifteen players against the fifteen players, and people come on and one of you. I don't like coaching from the side. Mm. You know, I don't think it, I don't think it's part of the game. I don't think it helps anything. I think it confuses anything, and I that I would get rid of uh, as insofar as you can. I get rid of all anything that uh, that, that transmits uh, directly uh, from from coaches to players because I don't think that's what the game is about. No, I lo- lo- I, I think. The best coaches that I've ever come across have always said, you know, our, our job's done on a Thursday evening after yep. the, the, the captain's run. You know, yep. the, the, the players and the captain are going to lead it on the field. So the context of this is that Rassi Erasmus apparently has been retweeting some incidents from a game from an anonymous Twitter page and, and talking about it. And then should an international coach be even allowed to be water? The, the, the thing is, Rassi Erasmus has actually had quite a history in, in, in doing this, Brian. In, in South Africa, there was a, there was a huge... Um, sort of focus made when he started coaching he stood on the roof at the Bloemfontein Stadium and he had a he had a um, 
almost like a like a flight uh, uh, navigator flight system, and he used to communicate with the players <laughs> on the field. Well, like in Top Gun when they come down and they're absolutely. All, you know, so it'd be you know two two greens and a red would mean do X or Y or and you know. <laughs> Uh, lift your left flap and do this, etc. And he was controlling the game like that. Now, I know, I know Rusty very well. He's immensely detail oriented. So he probably has got every single call, every single decision that needs to be made in the back of his head. And he almost wants to make it for the players. Maybe if he was in a, yeah. in a NFL style helmet on the and and Sir Khaleesi's thing, yep. he'd be happy with it. But that's him trying. You're not going to stop him trying to control bits of the game. If it if it's not going to be allowed, then it should be. A, a rule for everybody. I, yep. I don't like it personally because I think the team need to be uh, making their own decisions. But the rule is the water boy, which he is, can be on and off the field. No, I've never said that what he's doing. Oh, no, no, I'm, just, I'm saying that people, have, yeah. pe- people are saying, can the head coach do you, you, He's not the head coach, so he's actually no. probably purposely moved himself, but I don't yes. like it. I'm, I agree yeah. with you. I don't like it. No, I, you know, criticism of, of, of what he or Neil Jenkins have been doing, where I am Bob and... A lot of other people are just saying we don't want them to be able to do it. That's the point. That's the point. Not that they've done anything wrong. We just don't think the laws should be uh, done that way. Well, that's all we have time for this week on uh, Brian Moore's Full Contact. Uh, let me tell you before I go, though, this, uh, because this is very important. Um, a film is now out. It's a short film, but it's very worthwhile watching because uh, many of you will know Doddy Weir. He's a legend of Scottish rugby. In the 1990s, he was part of the Lions Tour in 1997. You'll also know him because of his tireless fundraising work to find a cure for motor neuron disease, which unfortunately he and several other um, of his sporting contemporaries, unfortunately, have been diagnosed with. His illness was five years ago, diagnosis. He's now made a short documentary with The Telegraph, and it's an honest and important insight into the changes in his day-to-day life. It's, it really is a lesson for all of us on how to stay positive when things go against you. There will be a link uh, in the show notes, so I urge you to find out more because it's well worth uh, your time. Huge thank you to my co-host Bob Skinstead and to Nigel Lawrence for joining me. If you've enjoyed this episode, why not register and check out some of our future episodes, including the miniseries Brian's Lions, where I've looked back at... Uh, well, everything lines with the great and good to Ian McGeekin on the first two lines to us, South Africa. The episode with Simon Shaw, who had to wait 12 years before becoming a test lion uh, and more. Um, I'll be back next week alongside with Bob. And let's hope uh, this is a difficult thing for a British person to say because I don't want the test series, you know, to, to, to die after the second one. But obviously, I don't want to be cheering for the uh, for the for the spring book. So let's Oh come on Brian, you let, can <laughs> <laughs> let's just hope there's lots to talk about next week. I'm sure there will be. Join us next week after the same test. Bye bye.